Celebrating 42 seasons on the air, Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, more on that new NAFTA replacement. The president says there's never been a bigger trade deal. And speaking of big, it's billed as the largest home and garden show in the southeast. Thousands attended, including us. And if you've got this in your garden, don't worry. Its bark is worse than its blight. And it's a truly unique program for Jalen Mates that helps them grow a better future. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Mike Russell. Thanks for joining us today on Farm Week. As we reported previously, the president has struck a new deal to replace NAFTA with something called the USMCA, the US, Mexico and Canada Agreement. The deal is only done in principle at this point, but it appears that American farmers, especially dairy farmers, are likely to benefit. Here's Peter Tubbs with more on USMCA. There's a brand new deal. The agreement will govern nearly $1.2 trillion in trade, which makes it the biggest trade deal in the United States history. Negotiations with Canada carried the talks into Sunday night, when both countries gave ground on issues that had slowed talks. But what I can say is that free and fair trade in North America a trading zone that accounts for more than a quarter of the world's economy, with just 7% of its population, is in a much more stable place than it was yesterday. Access to the Canadian dairy market had been a red line during talks, but negotiators traded increased export volumes from the Canadian auto industry for more American exports of dairy products. Dairy was a deal breaker, and now for our farmers, it's, as you know, substantially opened up much more. And I know they can't open it completely. They have farmers also. You know, they can't be overrun. The American Farm Bureau Federation applauded the New Deal. Trade is critical to agriculture, especially trade with our two closest neighbors. The USMCA builds on the success our farmers and ranchers have seen from NAFTA. The elimination of Canada's Class 7 dairy pricing program is a clear victory for our farmers. The American dairy industry sees the potential for millions of dollars of sales to both Canadian and Mexican consumers. So I think the certainty that this agreement brings uh, provides, I think, some stability uh, and some reassurance to the market, which hopefully over time will strengthen and stabilize the market. It certainly provides us with the assurance that our number one market for dairy, Mexico, will be preserved. It's going to help wheat. They don't take very little American wheat. Uh, they uh, take very little of our dairy products, poultry and eggs. And uh, for the, those segments of American agriculture, it's an ideal agreement. And uh, one that I never thought that they would get, particularly in regard to dairy. That opens up more markets for our dairy product. The scale of the American economy and its importance as a destination for Canada's agriculture and manufacturing output kept the country at the negotiating table. But the northern neighbor views the accord as both an opportunity and source of protection. It also needed to be fair, which meant that it would have to preserve the fundamental principle of the original agreement, which is that when your trading partner is 10 times your size, you need rules. You need a level playing field. Mexico also applauded the agreement. Entre otros beneficios, among other benefits, the new agreement promotes new, more responsible regional commerce in the area of labor and the environment. It helps create more jobs and better salaries to the benefit of workers of the three countries. From Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. This was a special year for the annual Fall Flower and Garden Fest. For four decades, this event has offered displays and activities to pique the interest of home gardeners everywhere. This year's attendees toured the Truck Grop Experiment Station's research gardens, learned about plant diseases and insects, shopped for fall season landscape decor, and a lot more. Farm Week's Amy Myers reports from Crystal Springs, Mississippi. 
Healthy living, healthy gardening was the theme of the 2018 Fall Flower and Garden Fest. Bus loads of visitors came to shop a huge selection of landscape items as well as learn about plant disease and insect management tools to use in their own gardens. Of course, Extension is responsible for providing non-formal education to Mississippians. It's a joint venture between the Mississippi State University Experiment Station and the Mississippi State University Extension Service. There's a lot of research that's conducted on this uh, location in the area of horticulture, vegetable crops. Then that research is uh, formatted into educational programs and provided to the public. The event offered educational sessions covering topics like DIY plant propagation and homemade pest control. We have about uh, 17 different garden seminars, walking tours, and workshops each day on cooking with cast iron, on uh, new plants for uh, 2018. Tell me what you got to see today. Uh, a lot of scarecrows, plants, and uh, butterflies. There's a lots of colors and like yellow, pink, whitish green, and orange. We need to know where our food comes from. We need to know how to grow our own food. We need to um, not just see in the grocery store and pack it up and you know, buy it and go. So I've learned a lot about that, how to make our garden more weed free and stuff like that. This is the 40th year for the Fall Flower and Garden Fest. Held at Mississippi State University's Truck Crops Experiment Station in Crystal Springs, it's the largest home garden show in the Southeast. I'm Amy Myers reporting. Here's a story with a bit of appeal. In fact, it's almost counterintuitive. We spend a lot of time in our southern gardening segments talking about color or growth or the size and spread of the foliage in our gardens. But in this segment, Gary Bachman takes a he said tree sheds approach. Hopefully by the end, you won't think he was barking up the wrong tree. Here's Gary. can be an overlooked feature of the landscape when compared to the colorful annuals we plant each year. Let's take a look at what I consider a landscape treasure. I'm really impressed with these properly pruned and maintained Natchez crepe myrtles in the Magnolia Botanical Gardens at the North Mississippi Research and Extension Center. Some folks like the white summer flowers, while others like the bright crepe myrtle fall color. But I really like the bark especially when it's shedding or peeling. This is called exfoliating bark and usually begins after the tree reaches maturity. I've had calls from worried gardeners asking questions on how to stop their trees from dying and what to spray on the tree to stop the peeling. When the bark begins to shed, don't treat the tree with anything. It's supposed to do this. The peeling bark feels like really thick and brittle construction paper. This year there seems to be more peeling than usual, and I think it's because of the really harsh winter we had last year in Mississippi. The exposed trunks reveal a gorgeous mixture of beautiful warm colors, ranging from beige and creamy yellows to cinnamon reds and browns that resemble a paint-by-number painting. These mottled trunk colors are highly prized by seasoned garden aficionados. So don't be so quick to cut your crepe myrtles back every year. You'll be rewarded with these beautiful trunks. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. Hopefully now you won't think your myrtle is so unfertile. <laughs> time now for the markets. The origin of two boll weevils that were trapped in North Mississippi about 10 days ago remains a mystery. That's right, Mike, and for 10 years, Mississippi has been completely free of boll weevils, but Extension says this development near Basel is no reason to panic. So what else is impacting the markets? Well, the government is increasing expected cotton production. Soybean exports may start slipping, but foreign sales of U.S. beef are booming right now. Some economists like O.A. Cleveland are pondering whether we're on the verge, maybe, of 80-cent cotton. We do for, know for a fact the USDA's October 11th supply demand report is calling for slightly larger U.S. production. 
U.S. production is raised 80,000 bales from a month ago with slightly lower acreage. Mississippi production is bumped up by 10,000 bales. 60% of the cotton in the state is harvested as of last weekend. At, th At this point, uh, a rally up to the 80 to 82 cent level uh, would be a gift at this point in time. I see the market moving sideways uh, for the next several weeks till we get further into harvest. Uh, obviously, a change would take place if there's any breakthrough with negotiations in China about our trade deficit or the tariffs we're experiencing now. Keeping in mind that perhaps by year end or the first of the year, there may be some progress with these uh, tariff situations with China, which would certainly, as the Chinese previous to this, had committed to make additional purchases from the U.S. to re reduce our trade deficit, and cotton was mentioned specifically. Crop losses in South Georgia from Hurricane Michael continue to mount. Economist Zoe Cleveland believes the loss number for cotton may approach 300 to 400,000 bales. And consultant Wes Briggs in southwest Georgia says a lot of cotton was lost back in 1995 when Hurricane Opal hit, but it was nothing like what he sees now after Hurricane Michael. And as for Georgia's pecan crop, specialists say only 5% of that crop had been harvested before the storm hit. Well, the government made a slight change this month in its outlook for soybean production this year. Expected U.S. production was lowered slightly from the September estimate. And in Mississippi, the size of the soybean crop was increased 1% from last month. U.S. ending stocks are now estimated to approach 900 million bushels. Trader Tom Fitzenmeyer is troubled by the fact the USDA did not lower its export estimates for beans in this report, but he says that will come eventually. I mean, if you look at the weekly exports, we had cancellations again by China, an unknown destination, a little tiny bit from Japan even. So um, I, I, we're not keeping pace with the, with the, with the projected mm -hmm. export sales. Most of the demand's going to, going, going to South America, um, or maybe a few beans going through Canada. Um, the, the, the bigger issue in my mind is you've got a carryout of 900, mm -hmm. darn near 900 million bushels. We've made our largest customer in, that we've had mad, so even if we reconcile things with them, that's not going to come back like it had. Uh, South America is on track for planting a big crop. Mm -hmm. I, 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 if you get a rally on these beans, you better use it to make some bean sales. And, and this, I'm going to store my beans for a rally. What, what rally? Why are we going to get a rally? S sell some of them mm -hmm. on a rally like this. As for wheat in the supply-demand report, the USDA increased both U.S. production and U.S. ending stocks last week. But there is a bright spot down in the numbers, according to analysts. U.S. exports of wheat were left unchanged from the September figure at just over 1 billion bushels. Trader Sean Hackett predicts that exports will be the bright spot of this market. He explains why. The exports are going to be very big. I mean, with all the shortages that we have in international markets and more to come, and we still think the wheat crop can come down further, the Australian crop is, and even now the Argentinian crop is an mm -hmm. uh, issue. So we expect that the wheat exports are going to be a very, very bright spot and going to continue to support the market during harvest pressure, but also lead to a new, new rally, we think, to new highs later on in the season. That's what the pattern has been in the past when we've had droughts internationally like this. Well, it's time to show you this week's trivia quiz question, and let's take our first look. It has to do with important row crop in Mississippi. Here's the question. What is considered the most devastating rice disease in the world? Is it A, grassy stunt, B, rice blast, C, sheath blight, or D, brown spot? We'll have the answer in a few more minutes. We're going to pause for a short break, but stay with us still ahead. A unique program that teaches advanced gardening skills to jail inmates. It's part of a progressive plan to help those inmates find ways to integrate back into society when their time is up. And it's presented by extension specialists and county agents. You'll hear from them and from the inmates too, all part of our feature story coming up. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Every day, real people are solving problems, learning skills, and achieving goals through extension education. We care about their success and yours. 
Extending knowledge, changing lives. The MSU Extension Service. Before we get back to the market report, let's take a quick look at the Farm Week calendar. First, a workshop for private well owners looking to improve their drinking water. This workshop is the last of the series in four different counties. This one at 6 o'clock in Holly Springs at 6 p.m. Marshall County on Tuesday, October 23rd. A grant is funding the workshop and bacteria screenings for the first 45 people who register for the workshop. It's $25 for everybody else. To find out when you can pick up your sample bottles and collection instructions, call 662-325-1788. The results will be mailed to each owner. Next, on Friday, October 26th at the Batesville Civic Center in Batesville, the 2018 North Mississippi Beef Expo. Registration starts at 8 a.m., the program at 9. There's a session on prepping cattle for the feedlot, one on nutrition, another program on disease diagnosis, and of course, there is a lunch and trade show. For more information, call Lance Newman at 662-832-4586. Now, check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. The USDA says beef exports set a new record in the month of August. Beef exports totaled over 119,000 metric tons. That is an increase of 7% from just one year ago. Trader Naomi Bloom says it's a good thing, though, the export business is this strong and also that consumer confidence is so high right now. If you want to talk about a happy export market that's solid, it's the beef market, and that's what's been pushing prices higher. The December contract has pretty big resistance at the 119 level, um, and that rightfully so because there's plenty of supply out there. Right. And thank God we have the export demand as strong as it is and that we have consumer confidence as strong as it is, and the restaurant parking lots are full all the time. People are eating out. Uh, the deferreds have a friendlier story with um, slight production reduction coming on in the first quarter, and as long as the exports can stay strong, I think you see the deferred contracts stay steady and work higher. I'm cautious about this December. I'm really watching this 119 level. In Newton, Mississippi, folks are watching the expansion of a state-of-the-art sawmill, a development that will add 30 new jobs at Buer Sawmill. The second saw line will mean the mill will turn out an additional 100 million metric board feet of lumber each year. The price tag for this addition and the facilities to support it estimated to be $40 million. Back to the trivia quiz now as we wrap things up for another week in the markets. Our question was, what is considered the most devastating rice disease in the world? The answer is B, rice blast. You wouldn't necessarily think of jail or prison inmates as gardeners. After all, as the saying goes, when you do the crime, you've got to do the time. But at one facility, inmates are given a chance to learn something new behind that razor wire, and what they learn may be good not only for them, but for the rest of society as well. Here's Zach Ashmore with the story. The Chickasaw County Correctional Facility has an interesting way to help its inmates integrate back into society when they leave. The county extension agent, Scott Cagle, has been running a program to teach agricultural skills to inmates willing to learn. This is our inmate horticulture program. It's 18 hours of training put on by extension specialists and county agents, and it gives the inmates a basic knowledge of horticulture that they can use to obtain employment once they leave the facility. The warden and his wife, both here at the facility, are two of my 4 H shooting sports instructors for the county. And the warden approached me about four years ago and asked if there was anything Extension could do to provide education to the inmates. And we got our heads together and, and decided that horticulture would be one of the top classes to offer. At the beginning of the program, the inmates needed a greenhouse and supplies to grow their crops. The Extension Service provided the materials and the inmates did the rest. The greenhouse and growing equipment were all constructed on site by the inmates a testament to their labor, ingenuity, and creativity. And we were able to provide the materials through a grant that the county had and let them do the labor themselves, but it's a professional greenhouse. It's thermostatically controlled, fans, louvers, lights, grow lights, 
and it's, it's built extremely well. They gained a lot of knowledge during the construction and during the operation of the greenhouse. And you can see the innovation that the inmates have, have come up with on their own just to grow things. They say the idle hands are the devil's workshop. Well, these folks can come up with a lot of different ways to, to take something you and I may consider garbage and turn it into something with a lot of worth. The inmates themselves have found a lot of worth in a learning opportunity that gives them real-world skills. They also appreciate the chance to have an outlet for their creative needs. Learn pretty much all, uh, all the different processes you go through, uh, the soil testing, just getting started basically, up to a smaller small scale, going to a grander scale. I was a, a part of the second class, and uh, I had the opportunity, the warden and Mr. Cagle, give me this opportunity to take care of this greenhouse and uh, I really took run with it. I guess they, they gave me the opportunity, I seized it, tried to make the best out of it, you know. And with their help, I mean, it's come along real good, I think. Uh, I like the, uh, the, the tomatoes we grow, the different kinds of peppers, bell peppers and hot peppers. And then we got uh, a little bit of everything, really. It's, it, I look, it's good for the soul, I think, <laughs> really. Uh, it's, it's been a good thing for me. Uh, I've done other things, you know, welding, fabricating, and this, this has just been wonderful for me. The prison staff has also seen improvement in inmate behavior as a result of this and other programs offered at the correctional facility. John Freeman, the director of programs, says that these activities, including the horticulture program, give inmates a sense of purpose while they serve their time. All of the inmates that are currently housed at Chickasaw are going to get out. So therefore, the warden on down, we really want to try to provide as much information, provide as many classes as we can for the inmates because they are going to re-enter society. And the more educational opportunities that we provide for them, the better they will be when they get out and the better their future will look and actually the better for the surrounding communities and Mississippi itself. Well, I actually believe that any time that the inmates are engaged in classes, whether it be educational classes, uh, any of our religious classes, anything like that lowers the incidence of negative behavior that we see out of any inmate. The more active they are, the better they are. And I feel that the more active they are, instead of just laying back there on a rack and waiting for their time to come out. They actually learn new things, learn how to socialize with people, uh, especially when we have people that come in from Mississippi State University Extension Service. Uh, I believe if you ask them, they will say that our inmates are better than some of the students that they actually have out in the real world because these people take the classes because they want to, and that makes a big difference because they really want to learn something. The produce grown at the Chickasaw Correctional Facility is donated to charity in Tupelo, Mississippi to help feed those in need. The administration has continued to encourage positive activities such as the horticulture program and many others. According to Administrator Amanda Huffman, this makes it unique among prison facilities in Mississippi. I think it is because we offer a lot more programs than anybody in the state and we we reach out to the community and get their input from like Mississippi Extension Service. Um, that is a huge, huge asset to our facility. Um, we offer a lot of hands-on things. We offer a lot of programs that have employable skills instead of just, you know, your basic things like your A and D. You know, everybody has to face those things at some point in time. But to have employable skills taught that's a huge asset because they have something that they can take to the world when they leave here. My husband and I, uh, he's the warden at the facility, and we have been 4-H um, volunteers with the shooting program here in Mississippi for about five or six years now. And Dr. Scott Cagle is the one that got us started in that. And he saw what we had going here and that we were trying to make a difference in the lives of the offenders here. So he kind of brought up the thing about, you know, hey, what about horticulture? And I love to garden, so that was right up my alley. And so that's how we got started. He got a grant. He's built us a greenhouse, which is fantastic. That allows the inmates to get out there and be hands-on other than just having a classroom. So that, that's the little story. It's, you know, 
Mississippi State Extension Service has really, really helped our community through many things. Although there are no studies yet conducted to prove that these programs help the recidivism rate from this particular facility, there is no doubt that giving inmates skills that can be used when they leave is giving them a leg up among others in their position. From Chickasaw County, I'm Zach Ashmore reporting. Great story. The Chickasaw County Correctional Facility also offers inmates a chance to develop skills in audio and video editing. So some real redemptive power there. It absolutely is, Mike. Now coming up next week, we uh, pass the baton. Last week, you met the 2017 Logger of the Year one last time. Now next time, you'll meet his successor. The U.S. has more than 750 million acres of forest land. In Mississippi, about 20 million acres. The value of all that timber has topped a billion dollars every year since 1993. Needless to say, those who harvest all those trees have a big impact on the state's and the nation's economy. You'll meet the 2018 MFA Logger of the Year next time on Farm Week. And remember, if you ever miss a story, look for the past episodes of Farm Week on our website, farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter as well. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.